Welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we have Anise Pereira with us. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Yeah, very warm welcome, Anise. Thanks for being with us. Hi, Joe. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for everyone that is listening. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm very excited to share a little bit about my work with you. Thank you. So you're a specialist in biodiversity cons conversation, conservation, natural resource management. You work with indigenous communities, as I understand, and um, around the topics of food security and agriculture, natural resources, sustainability, um, also with STEM education and climate change storytelling. Many of the topics that I in part here and there also engage myself with and something that I'm sure many of the listeners are um, very much interested in hearing more about. And what's especially intriguing, I think, is um, as we discussed um, um, before this podcast, is that you work in different sectors. You have a research background, are you still engaged also in research, in the research environment, the scholarly environment, but also work in applied applying research findings and bringing various stakeholders together so maybe to get us started could you share as, um, with us the motivation that you brought to that brought you into the current position where you're at and some of the steps that led you there okay so uh i am cursed with liking a lot of stuff and being really curious about a lot of stuff mm -hmm. so that's why my background seems so diverse and it seems like it's a lot of a lot of things and but i promise you that it's all connected um i'm a mother i'm a researcher i'm a project manager <clears throat> and uh i've started uh really into researching uh while i was doing my master's I was doing it uh, in genetics and molecular biology mm -hmm. and biomedicine. And it was then that I started working with plants and traditional knowledge because uh, I started uh, applying plant extract mixed with nanotechnology, chemical engineering, doing, um, now what's the name? Nano, uh, nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. Low with plant extracts used in traditional medicine to treat and prevent colorectal cancer. So that was my first uh, time mixing these two knowledges. Mm -hmm. uh, and that grew bigger and bigger. I went to my PhD, I finished my master, went to do my PhD in tropical knowledge. It's a tropical knowledge and management program but my focus was um, genetic resources, conservation and management. And I would mainly work with plants. Mm -hmm. And it was in that sense that there was this um, intersection again of indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked with uh, plants for food security, plant uh, as a source of health, as um, uh, sources of bioactive products that can later be used uh, for health purposes and plants as part of the ecosystem and as an uh, important part of, um, of the elements that keep the homeostasis for this beautiful planet. Yeah. Um, now I'm not sure if I responded to your question, but it's all about that. And yeah, no. I think that, yeah, the most that is uh, uh, brought to me, it's the importance of valuing every type of knowledge. Every type of knowledge has its place. Mm. So I'm stopping here and giving the mic to you. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for, for laying this out. And I feel I'm of the same carved out of the same piece of wood, I think is a phrase that people use. Like I'm personally also a generalist and I feel that in the research or people who sign up for research are either more declined towards 
specialism or generalism as a concept. And I think you and I and many others are easily interested or find an easy access to be interested in many different things or to explore a research question from different angles. Is what I found myself doing also in my PhD. And also looking beyond the research scope per se by finding ways or exploring ways how research, the research topic can be applied in the wider context of this planet, of um, challenges that we experience as humankind or with climate change. Um, so to see a very specific research question in a broad con complex context, while the specialists are very happy in their specialty niche, which can in itself be very complex as well. So I think there's these like two major types of researchers out there. So um, I can relate to, to your wide scope of interest and can also see like you explained how they all tie in with each other. So could you also to bring some of the listeners who might not be as familiar like you and I with indigenous peoples and indigenous knowledge system, um, what is different and where are the parallels that you see between scholarly knowledge and indigenous knowledge? And maybe you can also bring this together, both of us. Um, so, uh, indigenous knowledge is the type of knowledge that has been accumulated throughout centuries through observation and engagement within the communities. So, it, it has been experimented um, and in a way validated uh, just by time by time and experimentation after experimentation. Mm. Um, and of course, uh, in, in, the, in the sense, in the scope of proving that something is real or not, many people died. I mean, if we put it as an example, okay, imagine this indigenous community, <clears throat> they see the mushrooms, they have animals, some animals go and eat the mushrooms and die, they will say, okay, those mushrooms are not good. So that's part of indigenous knowledge. They will spread that, that knowledge throughout the centuries. And that's how we see uh, some communities in African countries, in the Amazon, mm -hmm. that know much more about the local flora and local fauna mm -hmm. than scientists. Yeah. And uh, the scientific knowledge, uh, it's something that we can follow the scientific method with, which is a quicker method. It doesn't, doesn't need to spend centuries and millennia trying to prove something. Mm. Uh, it's more uh, organized and systematic. And they both seem the same, seek the same objective which is to find truth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, scientific knowledge, many of the, much of the scientific knowledge has its roots in indigenous knowledge. And that's the interesting part of the story that is not often acknowledged. Mm -hmm. um, and indigenous systems represent a unique and valuable resource of scientific research for scientific research and discovery. Um, so we have these two, these two uh, types of knowledge that in my view are complementary. And, mm -hmm. but what happens is uh, we are living with the rise of technology and the scientific and technological uh, advances we are uh, uh, letting behind all of that knowledge that uh, and replacing it. Mm. But it's important to acknowledge that if the human race has survived till 20, uh, 2023, it's because of the indigenous knowledge. Mm. Yeah, indigenous yeah. knowledge before scientific knowledge. I mean, we, we've lived 
more millennia with thriving on indigenous knowledge than on scientific knowledge. Science mm -hmm. method is recent, is recent. So it's not something that we should just put behind our backs and just, oh, okay, oh, microscopes, uh, technology and everything, and let's forget about all of that. No, it's something that is still valuable and is still a resource. Mm. I think one example where it was appreciated was um, there was some narrative around the tsunami in 2005, was it, I think, mm -hmm. um, when the locals um, saw how the ocean retracted itself before it then swept with the big um, waves. And, and then, mm -hmm. like, the tourists, uh, it was mostly tourists who fell victim to the tsunami, but well, many of the locals could read the science that nature provided and based on past on knowledge that because this has happened maybe two, three generations before, they knew exactly what was going to happen uh, just a few minutes later and could um, find rescue in, in higher parts of the hills or somewhere. Um, that's one example. And I also remember... Uh, yeah, particular when it comes, like you mentioned, in, in, of how how functional ecosystems look like and and interact to produce a food system that then people and also other creatures can live on sustainably. <laughs> That's like we're losing that day by day as industrialized and science based nations or um, societies, and it's only. Um, indigenous communities and um, and people who live closer to nature, like in um, in villages and farmland, who are also exposed to seasons and and all of that, and and see firsthand how nature functions, without isolating certain aspects thereof into experimental setups and not seeing the complete pattern basically day in and day out. So, so yeah. So the research method, as valid as it is, because it's standardized, it gives us a, it it led to a lot of technological te technical advancements, but we're ignoring um, the complexity of nature and also the the knowledge that has been acquired over the centuries by people who are not not at shoulders, but are not sufficiently participating in the conversations as we're trying to address um the global challenges first of all climate change and that's yeah, i think the the um, the important part here is when i start to talk about that joe honestly many people uh that uh work hard to not understand what i mean uh just <laughs> just come with this oh so we should just uh believe in plants and go back to the ancient times in which we have no science and everything and just rely on plants and traditional mm -hmm. knowledge and forget about hospitals forget about science forget about all of that because that's important I'm like the importance of both knowledge are not mutually exclusive they can mm -hmm. be both important at the same time i'm mm -hmm. a scientist I love science. I love science. Mm. Uh, I have my my role models are scientists, Marie Curie and uh, Gregor Mendel. They're mm. scientists. <clears throat> However, what I'm saying is we don't have to start from zero when applying science, when making discoveries, when researching sometimes, because we have a valuable source that it's available to us and we can use to filter things, to see uh, where we can start and just to make our knowledge wider. Mm. Uh, I mean, for me, all of my, my professional and academic uh, percourse, my pathway just taught me that I know very little. So when I join my little knowledge with other people's little knowledge, it makes it bigger. Yeah. So I think I guess that's my point. 
it's not yeah. that hard to understand <laughs> <laughs> yeah i hear you like when when you introduce a new concept to people they often get scared or they question what they know and then they they feel like well that's not an option to let go of one for the other and not seeing the opportunity of both that or maybe it's because it's so new to them that they can't understand the benefits it can bring also to to scholarly research um so how does this now work in your daily practice when you when you teach or or lecture about climate change um how do you personally bring in like in 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 speaking engagements or when you engage with um students or what, what is your daily practice in trying to combine the two and make like provide access to to the concept of indigenous knowledge as a complementary aspect to knowledge creation uh the important thing is to break down climate change and not make it abstract mm. there are concrete things concrete examples that you can point to and say that's uh, a consequence of climate change you know the um, uncertainty of rain uh, the change of pattern of drought that's all consequence of climate change and point to clear uh, and concrete actions that people can uh, implement because it just comes with like a big monster, okay, climate change is coming, we're all going to die and there's nothing we can do besides uh, enjoy the rest of our lives <laughs> because we can die all tomorrow. Mm. It's not like that, it's not like that. We mm. can do stuff, we can do stuff. And it's not only about climate change. I mean, we uh, we could, it's, it's like saying, okay, we need to clean uh, our house because otherwise we're going to, to get sick because the accumulation of dirt, because of uh, fungi and everything will, a uh, dirty environment will make people sick, okay? Mm. But we also need to clean the, the house to make it nice, to mm -hmm. make it livable, to appreciate the place that you live in. So it's not just taking care of the environment and the, the biodiversity because of the climate change. It is because the, our planet is our home. I mean, we must take care of it. We must make it look nice, a nice place to live in, I guess. Mm. Um, and uh, the, the indigenous knowledge and local knowledge, it, it's, a, it's also a way to pay respect to the people that lived before us. I mean, uh, some of the knowledge that my grandparents passed on to me about when you were sick, and I'm sure you 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 have the same experience. When when you are sick, just make a ginger and lemon tea and put a, a sp full spoon of honey and drink it. And I do that with my kids. It, that's knowledge that comes. Mm -hmm. And what do we know? Ginger and uh, lemon can be uh can help immunity mm. uh, that scientific knowledge but yeah. before that my grandmother that never went to school she knew that yeah she out knew of that. experience yeah. exactly out of the experience so that that's how the two things the two worlds come in together and when you point to engage people is to point things they can relate with and not just come come like the savior i know something that you don't so you need to listen to me no just let's sit together and share knowledge you tell me what you know and i tell you what i know and mm -hmm. let's find common ground that's my way of working yeah i agree so now if we take food security as, as an example we know that many cultures have, thanks to indigenous and traditional knowledge, developed and cultivated various, like uh, a vast majority of and diversity of crop species, which produce um, an efficient amount of yield um, for harvest, but also are resistant and resilient to climate changes. Well, not, not the big climate change we're experiencing now, but to 
to seasons. They've adapted to the seasons wherever in the world they're being grown. Um, they they can um, sustain through through um, a little longer or a little shorter drought or rain periods. So they have a certain amount of resistance. But now with climate change um, and like the decline in forests and, and the ecosystems that provide for that environment for first the diversity of crops to produce the yield to, to, to then provide food security for the people on a local and regional level um, has been replaced thanks to technological advancements and, and the industries by um, by very few crop species who are very vulnerable to weather changes and particularly now to the climate change impact that um, has dramatic changes to weather conditions. And now there is a, apparently a trend to reinvent technology-based crop uh, droughts resistant or weather condition resistant crop species in the lab to reintroduce them into nature. Whereas we could go back to indigenous and traditional knowledge systems to consult with the people who are still alive today um, to ask them, do you still have um, uh, storages of seeds um, that have this variety to reintroduce them into, and you know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be so easy to solve the issue of food insecurity that we're experiencing all over the world. But the industry pressure seems to be reliant only on the science base and what we can do with the technology approach, which is nice and exciting, but it doesn't solve the issue, I would, I would put out as a claim. So, so I don't know. What's your view yeah, on that? Your, your, uh... Your example now, it reminds me of a story about how they expand, I don't know if it's real or not, but how they expand uh, lots and lots of money, I don't know how many million dollars to develop a pen that you can write uh, in space and the ink doesn't float up because that's the, the tendency. Mm -hmm. And they spent a lot of time and money trying to invent a pen, a special pen and everything. And someone just said, hey, we can use a pencil. And that solved the problem. I mean, <laughs> and that's it. Oh I mean, <laughs> I didn't know the story. <laughs> no. I heard about this story. I don't know if it's true or not, but I uh -huh. hope not because, I mean, it seemed obvious. Um <laughs> But yeah, we could go back to the pencils, guys. I mean, it's just a matter of acknowledgement. Acknowledgement and being more humble and understanding, as I said, that knowledge can come from different sources. Mm -hmm. uh, and you are giving now example of food, food security. Now we have very fancy term, for instance, germoplasm banks to store seeds, the best seed with the best genetic material to be replicated and to be used again in the next uh, season. But the germoplasm banks, I mean, since how many millennia ago that uh, agriculture uh, and people, farmers, used to, would uh, store the better seeds mm. for the next uh, for the following year, many millennia ago, without the fancy term. Yeah. So that's not new knowledge. It's just a new fancy word for it. And uh, of course, uh, in everything, everything that is alive, the basis of the strongest uh, species is diversity. Mm -hmm. So as you said, now we're focusing only in, uh, in a few number of crops were, were um, having uh, the same crops in agriculture. I mean, we have potato, we have uh, wheat, uh, maize, and some of the, the, the vegetables and cereals, but they're basically the same. Mm -hmm. So the, the genetic pool is becoming smaller and smaller. So the crops are becoming weaker and mm -hmm. more um, vulnerable to climate change, to diseases and to all of that. 
mm. and to just yeah uh so actually one of the things that i studied in my phd were the crop wild relatives which are relatives of some crops that are uh, edible so the the ones i was studying were diplotaxis which are the grandparents let's say like this of kale of broccoli uh, brussels sprouts that i really don't like and <laughs> those, <laughs> those <Yeah. two. laughs> and the ones we have in cabo verde are highly adapted to salinity to heat and to drought mm -hmm. so they constitute a reservoir for resilience genes that mm -hmm. can be later transferred to make these domestic crops more resilient to climate change. Mm -hmm. So here we see the importance again of biodiversity. Right. Um, yeah, to, to make things more resilient. And then we have uh, local and native plants that are being slowly replaced by those uh, popular crops. Mm. Uh, like for instance, now, and... sorry, exactly. And um, when when you are bringing new plants, when you are introducing plants to a new environment, it will require more. It will require more uh, resources to make that plant thrive, to make the crops thrive. So that's not very sustainable. It isn't. Yeah. But, yeah, we could. It, one of the focuses of, of my my uh, researchers also advocating to introduce more native crops to agriculture of each country mm -hmm. and try to shift the diet patterns back to that introduce reintroduce again the native crops All right i will dig up the reference but i've met uh, and her, her name is Mary and I can't remember her last name unfortunately but she's been studying she's a professor in Kenya and she's she's studying and advocating for indigenous vegetables in so also as a um maybe just to acknowledge the difference between in or the meaning of indigenous mean means um is basically to have been there since millennia or thousands and tens of thousands of years so to be native to a region and this can be people as an indigenous people who um who are classified like according to the united nations and um or self-defined as having a cultural identity um being the first inhabitants as we know um of a certain region and then often being marginalized by the mainstream society, which is often has a colonial history. Um, yeah. Whereas indigenous vegetables are also native vegetables to the region. But yeah, just using the, the same word to, to classify. I don't know. They're only just... uh, also often marginalized and left behind the native plants. And also, we yeah. place in diets and in uh, agriculture by introduced plants that require more resources and are more vulnerable, are not well adapted to the environment and ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So but, there are yeah. a lot of similarities. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, I met Mary in uh, at a conference a few years ago in South Africa, where she um, presented about her work and studying veg um, indigenous vegetables and also successfully eventually reintroducing those vegetables to the supermarkets in Kenya. So that just to mention as a success story. So it is possible to convince policy on a national level to reintroduce indigenous crops and indigenous vegetables for the sake of food security for the nation. So policymakers should have an interest and certainly have a stake and it takes quite a bit of lobbying, also research, like to make a case, to build a case that that's actually efficient and affordable. And yeah, and to to ease the pressure of being reliant on imports of, of other crops where the country usually has enough thereof and also um, resilient enough to deal with the uh, local weather patterns. 
Exactly, exactly. That's the part where uh, biodiversity governance comes in, uh, which is the using science to make a point. Mm. <laughs> and, and that also should be the, the one of the main goals of science, to produce real and impactful results, even in policy making. And we've done that with our research. We researched uh, beans that are being slowly replaced by other uh, cereals uh, and vegetables in my country. However, those beans require very little to, to have a yield and they're very well adapted. And uh, at the end, it resulted, uh, an article came out of it and a series of political recommendations, mm -hmm. including uh, reintroducing the beans into the public canteen system. So mm -hmm. we have a thing there. And uh, also eating the some of the beans leaves, we don't do that. Um, and mm -hmm. other recommendations, I mean, there are some plants that just grow. I When I was living in Cabo Verde, uh, before going to, to Portugal to do my studies, I didn't know that people used to eat those little cherry tomatoes. Mm -hmm. We used to use those things to play and hit our friends with it. Mm -hmm. And apparently when I went out, those are super expensive tomatoes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, now I don't hit people with it anymore. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are some foods that we're just not acknowledging and mm -hmm. they're just there to be used. Yeah, that's best. So if we now try to make a list or incentives for anyone who's listening in to us to also feel free to share with, with us, with Anissa and myself, um, what your experiences are. Um, but also, what can each of us and the listeners do to, to, yeah, to, to change the paradigm a little bit, um, one step at a time. For example, as a consumer, um, maybe demand if it's not there, or look out for regional, regionally grown, produced, and um, yeah, food supply, like including also meat, but also and dairy products, but primarily or just as much as um, vegetables. Mm -hmm. So think global, act local is the old mantra, which still holds true today. Um, and as as researchers, what like let's say we're already sensitized, but what was what can you recall from your own journey and your passion and and mission that you eventually embarked on, and what you know now? What can a, a researcher do who's maybe studying something around agriculture or biodiversity? to dig a bit deeper and, and leave a footprint like positively in the academic system? Uh, yeah, so I think that we should remember why we're doing this as a researcher, as a scientist, what's your goal? The goal of science is to find truth, is to contribute to the knowledge pool of the world, of the humankind. And truth can come again from different sources. Uh, so sometimes it's good to put our lab coat hanging there and just go to the world and see. And I just say that I leave the, the um, challenge of exploring a little more about indigenous knowledge. And I just say to my peers that they could be surprised of how much potential it has to just to come out with new research questions, mm -hmm. just as a starting point. And also it gives you the opportunity to be a little bit more humble <laughs> about your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a challenge, just try to engage more with uh, that kind of knowledge and to learn a, a little more about, mm -hmm. about that. 
Yes, an approach could be, this is sometimes what I do with the students in my courses, to do a stakeholder analysis mm -hmm. for your research project, to look who has a, a stake in this research question, and also looking at it from a perspective who can contribute in answering this research question besides us, mm -hmm. who else might already have knowledge as you know, the theme of this mm -hmm. podcast. Um, and then this can be in any part mm -hmm. of the world really, where there is, because there's indigenous communities in any part of the world, and there is traditional knowledge mm -hmm. banks or, or resources libraries that you can consult. Um, and yeah, I also like what you said um, just now, like there might be, if you're engaged with a, with an indigenous community and ask them what their particular challenges are today, it might bring um, very, sorry, um, the dog is becoming impatient here. Is that mean some side noise um, or background noise? So, um, because in, in Kenya, again, I guys spent a lot of time in Kenya in the past. Um, I have friends who are um, well, many, well, who are of different indigenous communities, Orgiek, um, Maasai, mm -hmm. Yaku. And I have a friend who's on, in a Maasai and they have the issue that their cattle, um, sometimes when they're roaming free in the in the reserve where there's also um, wild beasts who roam around and then when they engage with each other um so when they come close and sniff each other's noses they the wild beasts might infect the the cattle with viral infections or you know and then then the whole herd is um is in danger and might get sick and has to be euthanized um, in the worst case. And that basically then deprives the community of their livelihood, um, being cattle herders. So to find ways to to identify that virus and maybe get a, develop a vaccine for that particular, because at the time there was like, again, three or four years ago, when we spoke, there was no vaccine for a wild beast virus that's tr transmitted from wild beast to cattle. And the cattle didn't have an immune system where the, it wouldn't affect the wild beast, but it very much affected the cattle. So, so that would be one research question which would be vital for that community to, to sustain their livelihood in yeah. the country of Kenya. And there's many other examples where I think the benefit of coming together, sharing knowledge with each other, um, like from a scholarly perspective, an indigenous perspective, um, and then identifying needs and challenges on either end where which which can be compensated by the other community as a knowledge exactly. community. Yeah. Right now I'm working a lot with the project um, management and what I say and with local communities what I always try to add in objectives and uh, structuring and designing the project is not just about bringing new solutions to cuddle with new uh, with problems with to face the problems of the communities, but also catalyze and acknowledge existing solutions mm. of the community. That's also and, important. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Oh, and that brings me to another example. Um, I, I'm, you might know her. Um, so there's another friend. Um, um, her name is Hindu Ibrahim. She's very much active in the also with climate change um, discussions on international stages. She's often present at the IPAC, uh, not IPAC, also an IPAC member, Indigenous Peoples of Africa Coordinating Committee, and with the, uh, anyways, um, the Climate Change Council um, discussions. And she has a TED talk, which we also list in the resources to this podcast, um, where she explains how, I think it also has to do with rain. So there were researchers visiting her, her community in Chad, in the country Chad, where she's from and um and then they were sitting outside under a bush and then suddenly um 
the people, like the locals, were putting their stuff together and hiding in the huts. And um, and then the researchers are, what? The sky is still blue. Why are you going there? It's going to rain soon. It's like, what? Why? <laughs> like, I can't see any clouds. And then literally a minute later, the rain poured down. Like, that's how quickly the weather changes, apparently, sometimes in shut. And <laughs> in the Sahel yeah. region, probably. And then when they were eventually, so the, the researchers got soaked and then they eventually came also inside. And I was like, how did you, how did you know this? Like there was no sign in the sky. And I was like, we were just looking around and all the insects were busy hiding away. And that's how we could tell like rain was coming. <laughs> So it's simple, like, you know, taking notice of the, the little things, literally, in life, and being being aware that everything is connected and that we have, not like, little guardians which can guide us um, the way for, for weather changes to come in this example. So we are not isolated as humans from the rest of the ecosystem and we're just part of it and we can live and interact and learn from it and, and make decisions on the spot to hide from the rain <laughs> or more severe um, situations like the tsunami example we just had. So, but what what is an, what might be another example that you can share as in, um, like I also remember if I, I bring in another one from my end and then it's your turn again so to give you some a minute to think about like when it comes to ecosystem restoration to also restore microclimates to stabilize the weather conditions on the regional level again like it's it's only through a traditional knowledge that um like village village um dwellers like people who live in the villages um, through generations can still map and um, and inform again researchers and um, industry people how um, how a, a forest needs to be set up to be functional to also think through what are the the what's the pattern of the rivers and the flows in the region like the water ir irrigation system. Um, yeah, to restore functional ecosystems to make um, inhabitable environments inhabitable again, or to um, prevent um, desertification from happening further. So that's another example that I witnessed a few years ago. That was more like, I think like eight or 10 years ago, actually. So the mapping of previous ecosystems, which have now vanished, Thanks to logging and um, yeah, exploitative uh, measures for industry purposes or plantations that have been set up. Um, but if we now want to restore, strategically restore ecosystems, then again, traditional knowledge is vital to make that happen efficiently so that we don't lose time along the way in setting up ecosystems that are dysfunctional. Uh, yes, there are many examples of mm -hmm. that, uh, what I can think of in terms of, because I, I, I do, uh, I work more with um, traditional medicine in this sense, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of diagnoses and <laughs> medicine and treatments that are applied by uh, indigenous healers and traditional people that we can ever think about. But I do know that, for instance, um, that are many indigenous communities that use fire to manage ecosystems and uh, to promote growth of certain plant species. Um, I think that on, in Australia, they use coal burns to uh, manage wildfires, mm. um, burning small patches of land during the cooler months to, to prevent the building up of fuel, uh, fuel uh, that can lead to more destructive wildfire. So mm. that's an example of, yeah. and, and of think... uh, 
I think also Australia is reintroducing that, right? Like finally having acknowledged the Aboriginal knowledge in that sense, and then reintroducing yeah. that as a practice to prevent the big wildfires so, okay. from happening. Exactly. Australia and Canada, I would <laughs> say they are leading the acknowledgement and recognition and uh, officialization of Indian, uh, Indigenous knowledge. Mm. Uh, they are really up to that yeah uh, yeah and um, i think in mexico uh the maya people have practiced uh, a system called milpa milpa i think mm -hmm. that involves growing a variety of species together in uh, a poly culture mm. so and we now we're going back to that again how do you call it now? I forgot uh, the word. Um, I forgot the technical word. It just ran, mm. ran off my mind. But that is getting back to uh, again mm -hmm. to, to the field. And there are several programs um, trying to make farmers go back to this way of planting multiple crops mm -hmm. in, in one space and it's good for the plants it's good for the soil and, and it's good it's for a, the nutrition also because we get a variety of nutrients into our system yeah. so there are many things that we can come we can uh, go to the indigenous people uh, and go back to the indigenous knowledge and find a base mm. so scientific knowledge can build itself up yeah there's also um, so coming to a close in the interest of time. So we both have busy schedules um, towards the end of the week and the day um, and the day in the week. Um, but just to mention, there is also policy or, or declarations. There's the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people. There's a Nagoya, um, was a Nagoya agreement um, oh. protocol. Thanks. Um, there is an initiative called Local Context, which um, works towards making sure that indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge can be protected as well for the community in the sense that they can um, get acknowledgement for sharing their knowledge, but also avoiding misappropriation and ensuring, again, um, or some form of reimbursement, which can be monetary or otherwise, that the community receives in return of sharing the knowledge with 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 a society that in the past and continuously so has been quite exploitative to their community. So there's that, and also when it comes to data, again there is the fair principles for data sharing, but also the care principles, which um, were postulated by indigenous researchers. Um, to ensure authority, control, and ethics to be considered in any research project, in particular when it concerns engaging with um, indigenous communities. So we we'll list all of these resources in yeah in the blog post associated to this episode, mm -hmm. so you can look to the short notes and and explore. Um, yeah, the the work that you and Lisa and Lisa have. Um, contribute so we we'll, we we'll link to resources that you're sharing and yeah so we do have a few, mm -hmm. a few of those protocols we have the uh, united nations uh, declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples as well from 2007 yeah. we do have the tbd that has a lot of uh, the convention of biological diversity has mm -hmm. a lot of uh, aspects uh, on the protection of uh, indigenous people's rights yeah. And, yeah all right so um so thanks for so much for for your insights for sharing your experiences and your knowledge on these topics of knowledge sharing across knowledge systems <laughs> um and all the best for for your future engagements and welcome back to this podcast or so anytime um when we have some other aspects to to discuss and share with our audience thank you so much it was great, it was great to talk to you i'm the one to thank for the opportunity and i'm here 
if you need me again or if anyone that hears this wants to discuss any aspect of it please uh, share my contacts with him yes okay? well, we put um the yeah the contacts that you share with us to the blog post so we're all a bridge and happy to to hear from you listeners um and yeah all the best thank you okay have a great day and a great weekend